Okay, hello everyone. My name is Henry Eni. I'm a manager, I'm managing a, uh, a consulting firm in Switzerland. Our customers are mostly in Europe, but also in Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. We are in the GRC domain, governance, risk and compliance, mostly business continuity, information security, and privacy. And obviously we are uh, PECB, a PCB partner providing uh, trainings in these domains, 22301, 2701, and CDPO. I'm uh, also a lecturer at uh, Sorbonne University in Paris on business continuity and governance. So um, the objective uh, today is to talk about uh, cyber security and the uh, disrupt disruptive incidents. So a little, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the incidentology. I don't know if these words exist, but I, I guess you understand what I'm talking about. And uh, afterwards, to understand what are the um, good things about uh, business continuity preparedness and what, uh, um, in, in which way this business, the classical traditional business continuity preparedness doesn't work for uh, cybersecurity incidents, cyber attacks, like we had recently with the ransomwares. So we'll see with our, which are the characteristics of uh, a successful business continuity incident, plus uh, the unverified assumptions, what doesn't work. And we'll talk about what we can bring today to make sure that uh, we have a uh, new cybersecurity framework that integrates uh, uh, the business continuity. So, you probably heard about this one, WannaCry, WannaCrypt. It had uh, several names, but this screen is not WannaCry. This one is not Pitya, which, as the name shows, is not Pitya. Pitya was another ransomware that uh, appeared in 2016, and uh, this not Pitya just appeared recently. Uh, June 27, it's like fresh news, and uh, was basically working as a uh, classical ransomware. Now, it's uh, hard to say that, it's hard to use the word classical, but now we have uh, long enough experience with uh, ransomwares to, to tell that thing. Uh, except that after paying the 300 uh, US dollars in bitcoins, you get no keys because there's no one to retrieve the money at the other end. So that was a bad surprise for a lot of... Uh, so the only thing I can say is that if you get that screen, it means that you are in a real problem because you won't be able to pay for the ransom. Um, another thing that just appeared recently was the uh, Business Continuity Institute Cyber Resilience Report, which was uh, released early this week as well, uh, that shows that on a survey done on more than 700 um, companies all around the world in 70, 80 countries, uh, more than 50 of the 50% uh, of these organizations were uh, reportedly affected by a cybersecurity incident. And when I mean, because it has been done by the Con Business Continuity Institute, when I mean uh, affected means they had business continuity implications from the um, uh, cyber attacks, cyber disruptions. Um, basically, what we see is that um, out of these companies, 13% of them lost at least, at least, 250,000 uh, euros in cumulative uh, after, um, in the last 12 months. So, and these are purely direct uh, um, costs, direct uh, losses 
uh, from from re repair from repair and direct production uh, easily calculable uh, um, um, losses. It doesn't include the intangibles such as reputation um, um, damages. Sixty percent of the uh, top executives uh, say they were really concerned, which doesn't mean that they're doing something. They just are really concerned. 90% uh, of the companies have tested and exercised business continuity plan in relation to uh, cyber disruptions. But we will see what that means, because testing cyber disruptions, exercising the business continuity aspect of a cyber disruption is not as easy as it appears. Uh, as we do with uh, traditional business continuity for uh, physical damages. Uh, also, 16% of them uh, mentioned that they, it took them more than half a day to um, uh, repair, to recover from the cyber disruption, and in certain cases, several days. Um, again, we have another couple of pictures here, uh, you see that for roughly 30, 33, a third of these companies, um, it represented more than 50,000 euros in, in, in uh, cumul cumulative damages. And for a single most significant event, incident, 10% uh, of them was above 50,000 uh, euros. So we are here in a real, real, uh, um, I mean, concern, uh, which is probably much frequent than normal business continuity uh, events that we've been prepared for in the last decade, let's say. Uh, last two pictures on this survey. You can see here that Roughly 25% uh, of these uh, incidents, uh, um, the average response time was above three to four hours, which is basically a, a full day off. And uh, we had, you can see, uh, uh, some only 20% of the company had no cyber or major cyber incident in the last 12 months, and one third, or a little bit more, one to five uh, cyber incident in the last 12 months. Okay, so let's move to business continuity preparedness. A business continuity preparedness as a life cycle, which is basically what happens just after the event, emergency activities, the recovery activity is to basically find a, a plan B, making sure that you find a solution to uh, uh, your discontinuity, to your disruption. Restoration activities and some activities after going back to normal. And that is divided normally between these three layers, which are strategic, top management executives uh, decision level, tactical at the managerial level, and operational level. So that represents uh, four types of plans. The emergency response, which is mostly just a few hours after the event and cares about protecting life, health and safety, mostly, because remember we're talking normally about events that just, uh, such as fires or, or equivalent that are threatening life. Um, the uh, disaster recovery or IT disaster recovery, which is purely operational and cares about providing a plan B uh, technological solution or solutions. The business continuity itself, which, which cares about continuing the business, providing uh, a financial interest of the company. And finally, a purely strategic uh, uh, responsibility on the crisis management level, protecting the reputation of 
the uh, company and managing the long-term effects. So resilience, it's all about being prepared. Preparedness or unpreparedness. Unpreparedness leads to dramatic effects. Preparedness uh, leads you to resilience and bouncing back from events. But that's only part of it, because you have also good luck or bad luck. You have staff commitment who are going to work off hours all night, overnight, to make sure that uh, you recover. You have good or bad timing. It can occur over the weekend or just before uh, the closeout, just before you need to deliver your numbers to the stock exchange. Or, and then you have the chaining of events, many other criteria that make uh, the difference between a dramatic event or a, uh, a positive outcome. And resilience, business continuity, is basically about making sure that these other criteria, these other uh, uh, parameters, luck, timing, self-commitment, staff commitment, etc., are less important than the preparedness. That is the uh, pure objective of business continuity. So what are the characteristics of a good and successful continuity planning? We have um, nine characteristics that we want to go through. First one is identifying critical business functions, is understanding that uh, delivering product and services, uh, receiving orders, preparing uh, 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 the, 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 the uh, transport of your goods to the customer are critical services. IT is a critical service. Uh, physical security is a critical service. Accounting is not a critical service. I don't know if you, there are some accountants here, but accounting is a less critical service. Then we have to identify realistic recovery time objectives. Recovery time objectives, I guess you are all familiar with business continuity, are the time after which you want to have recovered your uh, uh, activities. Uh, as well as usable recovery point objectives. When do you, um, um, how old shall be, how fresh, how old shall be your data to make sure that you are able to uh, re restart with fresh data as soon as you have recovered. Another characteristic is doing periodical risk assessment making sure that you have identified all the threats that can um, alter, that can disrupt your business. Assigning key staff backups, making sure that you have a backup for all the uh, personnel who is key within your organization and making sure that if you have a disruption, there is someone to recover. Preparing technology workaround strategies. Uh, particularly for cyber, uh, cyber incident, we have to make sure that we have solutions to continue the work, to continue to uh, work without the uh, IT resources or without critical resources uh, such as the building or a key supplier, for example. Involving the staff, all the staff needs to be involved uh, making sure that uh, you uh, go from a reactive posture to a proactive posture. And that obviously results into changing the culture of the organization to a resilient culture. And finally, and the most important, exercise, exercise, exercise. I told it three times because it's probably three times more important than all the rest. All the object of this is basically to obtain a business advantage from being prepared. A business advantage 
that you can be you can calculate and and, and come with a uh, return on investment the return on investment of the preparedness uh, however cyber attacks comes with some unverified assumptions all these characteristics that i showed uh, before these nine characteristics cannot be totally verified for the uh, cyber attacks and we'll see that more uh, in detail in the in the next uh, in the next slides i did identifying critical business functions yes we can verify it in even for cyber attacks because they remain the same in in, in uh, whatsoever type of situation identifying realistic recovery time objectives no obviously the the uh, experience with the uh, events the incidents we had with the ransomwares with WannaCry and and more more recently with NotPetya shows that the uh, recovery time objectives set by the organizations uh, for the business continuity plans do not apply are not respected in case of a major cyber security incident uh, the same happening for uh, recovery point objectives. What's the point in uh, having uh, backups, uh, fresh backups, let's say, from 24 hours, if you have no way, nowhere to uh, reinstall them and uh, have uh, access to them? Risk man uh, running periodical risk assessment. Uh, we say usually we are always more clever after after the incident, which, which is the case in uh, in this case, for example. Most of the companies that were uh, doing risk assessment and uh, identifying the cyber threats uh, obviously didn't uh, come up. Did it, uh, could not imagine that the uh, uh, the uh, impact of the ransomware uh, were the one we uh, faced with the uh, recent event in, in, in May and in uh, this month of June uh, with the ransomwares. The impacts were far above what we uh, expected when doing the uh, risk assessments. <laughs> Assigning key staff backups, that's, that's okay. I mean, it's just a purely organizational uh, um, uh, measure to put in place. Uh, it's a manager, managerial uh, measure to put in place. Preparing technology workaround strategies, that's for sure. Uh, it's the, the one of the uh, measures that we have to make sure we uh, implement, especially as we are getting out of um, uh, the uh, we are uh, running out of uh, information system after a cyber attack involving the staff as well uh, creating a culture of resilience is a, a verified assumption as well but the ex exercising it is not in fact exercising uh, only works with realistic scenarios that you have been experience, experiencing. And in uh, the cases we uh, um, experienced uh, with the uh, ransomwares uh, recently, uh, most of the, the exercises scenario uh, were not planning we're not Im imagining having that type of uh, impact uh, we usually say that impact is based on trust trust between all the stakeholders and uh, trust that all the the other stakeholder will basically uh, be able to uh, survive to cope with the incident and in uh, the latest cases, what we showed, it, it was not the case. Basically, uh, in some uh, organizations, the company, the customer, and even the suppliers were affected by the uh, um, cyber incidents. 
Um, the World Economic Forum uh, Global Risk Report 2017, which was, which was released in, in early this year, in February, March, showed that um, among all the companies surveyed, cyber attacks and data fraud and theft were considered by the top 10 uh, uh, risks as much as the migration flows natural disaster or extreme weather events or even terror terrorist attacks so it is considered today as being one of the biggest threats for the organization's continuity why are these cybersecurity incidents specials? They are special because the threats are, the source of the threats are different. The source of the threats are from activists to even states, uh, um, uh, governments, other foreign governments um, conducting attacks and obviously uh, organized crime also somewhere in the middle. So it's, they are special because it's an aggression. The business continuity uh, traditional methodology frameworks are not, were not based on the fact that you are being aggressed. This is an aggression. The company assets also are different. The company assets are uh, not the buildings that are destroyed by a fire, they are not um, um, suppliers that are uh, 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 going bankrupt and, and basically uh, ruin your supply chain. The company assets that are affected in this case are data or simply the money of, uh, the, of the organization. The, act, the attack vectors as well are different. The attack vectors are uh, attack vectors that are normally uh, managed by technical individuals within the organization from the uh, IT security part of the company. Business continuity uh, teams within the organizations and IT security teams are not used in most of the organization I've been working with to discuss together. And now they have to start interacting. Um, what are they special as well? Because they are polymorphic. They are totally uh, different from one attack to the other. They change. The way they are uh, uh, um, occurring, the way they are happening to, to the organization is different from one, uh, if, from one incident to the other. They are fast uh, fast pacing and quickly evolving and uh, the company most of the time are not prepared to react to such a, uh, a speed to such a, a, a fast uh, response they are complex complicated to understand most of the time uh, top executives managers are not prepared business managers are not prepared to react to that type of event Obviously, they are unexercised, untested, because they were not identified in the first place. So, what can we do to achieve cyber resilience? The essentials is basically what we um, find in the art of war of Sun Tzu. Know your terrain, know your enemy. So, that's what we are going to do. In which threat region are we? Are we in uh, North America? Are, is our operation in the Far East? Is our operation in the Middle East or in uh, Eastern Europe? All these will have different uh, uh, implications. In which sector am I? Am I in the utility sector, energy, transportation? Am I in the uh, retail, in the banking industry? So these two uh, factors will uh, tell us that, for example, we are facing 
uh, attackers which are cybercrime or simply terrorists, cyber terrorists. Uh, what would be their motivations? If it's terrorists, obviously it wouldn't be the same that if it's uh, uh, the, the organized crime. Um, how would the attackers proceed? How would they get into our uh, uh, environment? Which assets are they going to attack? What would be the consequences for my organization? What could be my responses? What shall I communicate to my customers, to my suppliers, to my, to my staff? So let's give a couple of examples that uh, we have uh, experience. If you are running a utility operation in the Middle East, such as Aramco in, in Saudi Arabia, the gas, the gas company in Saudi Arabia, uh, the attackers could be cyber terrorists, and that, by the way, Aramco was attacked by cyber terrorists in 2014. Uh, for ideology purposes, for example, uh, what would they? What system would they use? To, uh, how do we, would they proceed to get into your system through a Trojan, for example, with? Targeting the physical infrastructure, targeting the uh, uh, um, the ref re refinery, for example, uh, refinery system through SCADA, and make sh making sure that they come up with physical destructions by uh, jeopardizing uh, uh, physical uh, uh, devices. So, my response, obviously, after uh, eradicating the threat would be to uh, notify my customers, notify my, my um, uh, stakeholders, and uh, explain which would be, for example, the duration of the failures or the workarounds. In other the case, uh, if we have a bank in the Eastern Europe part of, uh, in the Eastern part of Europe, um, we are more likely going to face criminal organizations and uh, which would be targeting money, for example, through unpatched software with the objectives to retrieve uh, credit card information. In this case, we will get a, mostly a reputational damage and uh, the main action we'll have to take would be to uh, manage the crisis and obviously uh, uh, in, uh, start forensics uh, activities and basically inform my customers how to get reparations. So we see that we have mostly a managerial and executive type of uh, response in both of the cases. So. The executive point of view in this case uh, is how we need to change the uh, the um, the way top management is going to um, care about the cyber incidents. Cyber incidents, until recently, were the headache of the IT security or the IT departments. And now they need to be the concern, the main concern, or one of the main concerns, main risks of uh, the uh, executives. So basically what, what does it tell is that we need to work on the risk level. The executives need to own that risk. Owning the risk means that we put in place what necessary measures to eradicate, to mitigate those risks. We need to put a cyber risk management framework, a cyber risk governance framework under control. Uh, we need to make sure that the cyber risks are shared between IT and the business, not only in the hands of the IT security individuals. We need to implement cyber threat intelligence, so having multiple sources of intelligence 
within the environment to make sure that we know when there are uh, specific uh, risk or threats to, um, uh, uh, to manage. And most, the most important of all is adopting dynamic and real-time uh, cyber defense postures. So reacting specifically to every threats with different approaches. So one of the uh, best frameworks that was uh, uh, produced recently is the one that has been produced by the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, which is on the dr in draft state for the moment, but will be released in its first version like during the summer. It's the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. And when we talk about cyber resilience, you see here cyber resilience is basically nothing more than cybersecurity and business resilience put together. So these, this um, framework is basically based on these five um, domains that we are going to quickly cover. Uh, these five domains are the identification. Identification is basically knowing your ecosystem, your business environment, understanding. It's basically what you do normally when you do a business impact analysis or when uh, you are producing a normal uh, um, business continuity framework. Knowing your assets, which are your, which is your data, which data is uh, uh, at rest, which data is uh, in motion, which are the interfaces with external systems, with your suppliers, uh, which are the roles and responsibilities. The governance structure, who's managing the information security, uh, which are the risk, which are the uh, privacy requirement within your organization and a uh, comprehensive risk analysis based on all these uh, factors. The second domain is the protection. Protection goes from the access control, logical and physical access control, making sure that you are strictly always aware from who is getting into your logical or physical premises. Awareness and training, making sure that you train from uh, suppliers, senior executives, normal and privileged users, and even security specialists within your organization. And data security, ensuring data security through uh, cryptography or through uh, multiple uh, uh, physical protection uh, measures of the data at rest and in motion of uh, the asset life cycle, physical asset life cycle, what you do uh, with a laptop, for example, after it has been uh, um, uh, decommissioned, DLP, intellectual property, and uh, privacy of personal identified information. Uh, three more um, topics within this uh, protect domain. All the uh, information security procedure that we uh, uh, normally find as uh, mandatory in the uh, Annex A of the ISO 27 uh, standard. The control, maintenance, and repair of all the assets of the organization and the change management of them, and all the protective technologies that we have to put in place to protect the special system, protect the networks, protect the uh, logs and, and the audit data. Third domain is related to the detection 
with basically everything you do when you uh, run a security operation center, a SOC, from uh, detecting uh, the events, as Eric Gold told us during uh, the lunch, uh, making sure that out of the 50,000 events you have every day, you have a way to uh, analyze uh, more than 50, or at least get a summary of what, ap of what were the important events that occurred during that day. All the continuous monitoring that you put in place with normally a team doing it during uh, network mon monitoring, physical environment monitoring, which is in some cases just uh, left away because people put all the emphasis on uh, network monitoring. Staff activity, which is related to behavioral, behavioral analysis of the, of the staff on the network and even third-party uh, monitoring. Unauthorized resource detection is making sure that uh, if some um, staff uses uh, an authorized device or device that has not be uh, uh, accredited by your organization, uh, well, you're able to detect it. Response, which is the uh, third, uh, the fourth uh, domain in which you basically define your response procedure and you exercise them with day-to-day uh, -day events and incidents that, are, that uh, usually occurring. Uh, you educate your response staff, edu uh, you uh, ensure that your uh, events are reported all of them are reported, classified, and prioritized. And you uh, put in place all the analysis, forensic analysis, through a uh, laboratory that you put in place together with your security operation center. After contention and eradication, which is the first response to an incident, you basically are uh, required to improve by putting in place uh, a, uh, a review of the response strategies uh, to um, do continuous improvement. Finally, the last domain, which is the uh, recovery. Recovery planning, uh, recovery procedures, which are the um, traditional business continuity recovery procedure that you put in place with the difference that you are going to adapt them each time you have an event to make sure that you are having a recovery plans, recovery plans which are adapted to the latest events. Communications how to handle the public relations uh, management, how to handle the crisis, how to manage the reputation. Cyber security events have, a, uh, have mostly a um, reputational damage, a reputational impact in the organizations. And obviously, uh, learning from your uh, uh, events from these incidents. That was my last slide. Thank you very much.